Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore. Well, today, we're going to do something a little bit different again. I am going to explain to you how technological knowledge and understanding in the 41st millennium could actually possibly decrease. Not why, mind you, but how. For whilst the two may sound similar and intertwined, the how and the why are actually quite separate. For the why is fairly simple. As I am sure all of you know by now, the Adeptus Mechanicus, whom the Imperium rely near completely upon for 99% of their technology, are of the understanding that all knowledge worth learning has already been learned during the golden age of technology to be precise, and now the duty of the Adeptus Mechanicus is simply to piece together all of the lost knowledge. Or to put it more bluntly, the book of the sum total of human knowledge has already been written, and its title of course is STC. Now it is just a question of finding all the lost pages. And with such an understanding, innovation is of course impossible, because if all knowledge is already known, then trying to invent new knowledge is not only pointless and impossible, but hazardous. How is one to know, after all, if the new innovation is good human knowledge, or a ploy of chaotic or xenos entities to mislead and subvert the technological purity of humanity? But the how is far more interesting, because of course this is not a natural state of existence or affairs. See, when I first discovered 40k many, many, many years ago, I thought that the idea of the Imperium's steady technological decline was a silly one. Because in a universe like the 41st millennium, that for all its limitations is still filled to the brim with all sorts of advanced technology, well, surely in a universe like that some form of advancement must be unavoidable, right? Because amongst the quadrillion of souls inhabiting the Imperium, there must be those who look at their alarm clocks in the morning and think to themselves, how do they work? And of course, religious sanctions against messing with any and all forms of technology will scare off many, but still there would be those that decide to pick their clocks apart and then put them back together again, and thus in the process gain a better understanding of how they work. There would also be those who are surrounded by technology at all time, like local guild technicians. Most planets, you see, don't have a huge number of certified tech priests around, and so often minor tasks like the maintenance of, say for example, mining gear, like jackhammers or hard hats with lamp packs, are left to the locals, who are given some extremely basic instruction on how to carry out simple tasks, and then left to their own devices until something like a major repair is required. So there would be, one assumes, be some people with a very basic, sure, but nevertheless tangible understanding of technology, after which the mother of all invention would step neatly onto the scene, and her name is of course Necessity. The jackhammer is bouncing too much, maybe strengthening the shock absorbers will help. The lamp pack on the hard hat is too exposed, and keeps getting fuddled up with cold dust making it short out, maybe making a covering for it will help, and so on and so on. This has throughout history proven to be a near universal human truth, that we seek to improve our lot by minor and incremental improvements. And this holds true even during periods of extreme religious persecution, by the way, such as when a certain Italian was granted permanent residency at the state's expense, and even bread and water for life, in return for his silly statements that the Earth orbited the Sun, and not the other way around. Admittedly, I am sure the Mechanicus have even more effective tools of persecution than the Vatican, but the point still stands. Even in a less than welcoming society, innovation would, one would think, seem unavoidable. 
So how come it just isn't happening? Well, a lot of it has to do with an inescapable fact of the Imperium. Namely, that it is an enormous and ancient organization. Now, I'm sure any students of history out there will know that human empires have been tried before. <laughs> Perhaps not on the, uh, you know, interplanetary scale. But nevertheless, human history is the history of empires. A vast multitude of empires and kingdoms, large and small. And whilst many of them have of course been destroyed by external factors like natural disasters, or simply being invaded by an even larger empire, but just as many, if not more, have destroyed themselves. There exists, of course, no better example of this than the Roman Empire, one of the mightiest and largest empires in human history, that was destroyed not so much by the mass migrating hordes of barbarians, although that was certainly a contributing factor, as much as it was destroyed by the incompetence of its rulers, the incompetence of its people in power, and the collapse of what was once the finest military system in human history. Now we are not going to divert too much into a lesson on the Roman Empire, but to simply say that this story was hardly unique. Successful empires breed safety, safety breeds complacency, and complacency in turn breeds the poison of empire, indolence and corruption. This is the inevitable consequence of a stagnant and sedentary empire. And the reason for it is as inevitable as the final outcome is unavoidable. Now we could go for quite some time discussing this phenomenon, but I think one of the easiest ways to exemplify this is the increasing level of mediocrity and eventually incompetence that is created in any system that is sufficiently successful and large. This phenomenon is, in my opinion, best explained by something called the Peter Principle. This concept was first explored in 1969 in the book The Peter Principle by Lawrence J. Peter. Once more, for the sake of brevity, we'll try to keep it short, as the principle itself is actually fairly simple to explain. When an individual enters into a larger system, and that system could be anything from modern day education to agrarian work in the 41st millennium, or indeed, more relevantly, the Adeptus Mechanicus, that individual will, to begin with, probably be quite good at his initial task, the entry level of his job and career. And as he has thus demonstrated his ability to carry out whatever menial task he has been set to, odds are he will eventually be asked to oversee others in carrying out the same menial task. In other words, he'll get a promotion. Now this is not true for all Imperial planets. Many Imperial planets are, well, downright surf systems, where you live and die within the exact same job and the exact same social circumstances as your parents did. But this of course only compounds the sedentary nature of the Imperium, it does nothing to prevent it. To return to the point of our little example Imperial Citizen, after being promoted he proves to be fairly good at this job too. He is quite good at directing people around to do what he used to do, and so he is promoted again. Let's say that he's a low-ranking tech priest. Initially he is given the task of overseeing a simple conveyor system. 
Once he is proven capable of doing so, his responsibilities are extended. He now oversees multiple conveyor system and the servitors used to operate them. Once proven capable at that job, he is given a segment of the manufactorum to run and so on and so on, until eventually he reaches the limits of his competency. He arrives at the job where he has exactly the correct amount of responsibility and exactly the correct tasks. And, as always, as he proves that he is capable of carrying out these tasks, he will, yet again, be promoted. But now, he is no longer competent at all of his tasks. Now there is some new added element that he's not good at. Perhaps he's been elevated to the point where he needs to worry about interforged politics. Perhaps he now has to deal with other Magosses. Perhaps now he has to deal with research matter outside of his desired field. Regardless of what the thing is, he is now expected to deal with something that he isn't really good at. And so, since he is now no longer capable of demonstrating a mastery over his tasks, this is the point at which he will cease advancing up the ladder. This is the Peter Principle. That if given enough time, any sufficiently large system will eventually be staffed toe to head with people who are at least marginally incompetent at their current position. In the 41st millennium, this has been going on for 10,000 years. And to make matters a lot worse, with the extended lifespan of humans, particularly Magosses within the Adeptus Mechanicus, this eventual plateau of incompetence will be maintained not just for decades, but quite possibly for centuries. Which will also add in nice little roadblocks for the promotional career of anyone underneath him. Wherever our Magus stops, well, he's likely to be making damn sure that nobody takes his job. And he's also likely to make damn sure that nobody from underneath him rises above him. This too is a simple human thing. Nearly unavoidable, even if not completely. This then results in an extraordinarily sedentary system where the majority of people in positions of power will be at least marginally incompetent at their jobs. And as the entire system is cursed with this, they're not going to be getting any more competent either. There's not a whole lot of on-the-job training in the 41st millennium for higher-ranking officials. Nor can they rely on new and innovative technology to ease their burden or facilitate an easier grasp of their workload. They're stuck, and their tools are only going to get worse. Which leads us to the next interesting problem. Namely, that when people are in positions of power, they tend to not want, as we already touched upon, other people to come up and compete with them for those positions of power. This too is something we can see countless examples of throughout human history. As a humans, well, we're not a species that easily gives up something we've already obtained, even if doing so would be to the betterment of society as a whole. Again, there are standout examples of this actually happening, but they are few and far between. Thus, a system ruled by the incompetence will undoubtedly prefer to promote further incompetent individuals up underneath themselves. Those who will pose no true threat to the guy in charge's position. And they, in turn, will of course jealously guard their positions. And so on, and so on, and so on until we finally arrive at the beautiful state of khakistocracy.
And no, that is not a made-up word. You probably heard about aristocracy, right? The rule of the best. Well, khakistocracy is the exact opposite. The rule of the worst. Now, of course, this does have some natural limitations introduced by competition, and there is a degree of competition even within the 41st millennium. Various um, temples and forge temples, for example, on Adeptus Mechanicus forge worlds will compete with one another for the attention of higher-ranking Magosers. Various production lines or pit crews, or even things like individual Magosers themselves competing with one another another for research grants, access to technologies, and the patronage of those above them. And thus, obviously, they will require some degree of competency beneath them as well. In fact, it might even be desirable to do so. <laughs> In a perfect world, I suppose, you would have a system full of incompetent people that are just slightly less competent than the man at the top, but more competent than the opposition. Which is a rare state of affair, although it has been achieved on at least a couple of occasions through human history. See, Napoleon, for example. But this then provides a certain counterbalance to the elevation of the incompetent. As anyone in a management position will desire to have competent people under him, but also simultaneously make sure that they can't get past him. Now, uh, there exists a system that facilitates that quite nicely, of course. A form of aristocracy, where your position is yours through birthright or some divine claim some reason or rationale why you can gather all the competent individuals in the world underneath you, but they cannot take your position. In the case of the Adeptus Mechanicus, it's obviously a theocratic reason. Because you might think that this, this couldn't possibly happen within the Mechanicus, right? I'm sure I'm hearing the objection right now from somewhere out there in the ether. The Adeptus Mechanicus operates solely on logic, after all, and thus they would clearly defeat the Peter Principle. They would simply demote the person in question, or at the very least, they wouldn't retain incompetent people when there are better people suited for it. They would would just instead, much like a light bulb, switch out the person in question for the brighter bulb. Uh, except, of course, remember, there is a key falsehood that undermines all the logic in the universe that exists at the very core of the Adeptus Mechanicus. The belief in the Omnissiah. This is the true beauty of the hierarchical system of the Adeptus Mechanicus. You may indeed have a largely meritocratic system based on individual achievement, but positions and the processes with which you achieve those positions are all ritualistic in nature. Even simple maintenance is ritualistic in nature. And if you have a system where every single solitary action down to the lowliest thing of, well, replacing screws on a maintenance panel is a theocratic ritualized act with firmly set laws and rules, <laughs> well, in such a system, whoever controls the theocratic side of things also controls the logic of things, as of course the logic is subject to the theocratic elements, to the point where the logic only works so long as the church says it works. But what about other forms of meritocracy then? I mean, the Imperium is full of planets, right? Let's take an example outside of the Adeptus Mechanicus, so that we can remove ourselves from the ever-present rules of the Church of Mars. What then? Well, in the Church of the Adeptus Ministorum, you've got pretty much the same system all over again. But where church politics will play a larger role, as we've seen with various <laughs> uprisings and upheaval within the Ministorum. They are not quite so 
found by the theocracy, ironically enough, as the Adeptus Mechanicus is, as the church's internal workings can exist separate of the church, whereas for the Adeptus Mechanicus, the two are one and the same. Everything is a religious act, and thus there is no existence outside of the religious, not even the politics of the Adeptus Mechanicus. But again, we've, we've basically got more or less the same social structure within the Ministorum. What then about the Administratum? Well, the Administratum is more of an aristocracy than it is a meritocracy. See, at some point, no doubt, when Malkador the Sigilite was originally creating the Adeptus Administratum, he was intended to have the brightest people in the highest positions of power, obviously, with a nice and fluid system to encourage promotion so as to make the entire system more effective. But this, of course, requires a constant supply of highly competent and educated individuals, which come from the general populace, right? But how do the general populace get educated? Well, within a brighter, more bushy-tailed version of the Imperium, there would be public schools, all sorts of um, programs to raise up intelligent people, to award them with scholarships, and to make sure that they get every opportunity in the world to make it to the ranks of the Adeptus Administratum. And whilst that Imperium may once have existed, it no longer does, in large part due to, of course, the incalculable damages inflicted upon the Imperium by the Horus Heresy, it necessarily fell back on a more aristocratic system, due to the simple fact that there would be fewer resources to go around, there would be less education, higher education would be available to less people, more people would be required to do base and low level jobs, and so, slowly but surely, Higher education would become the near sole prerogative of the upper echelons of society. And the moment this ball gets rolling, it'll only get worse, of course, as after a generation or two, you will have an entrenched aristocracy. An aristocracy that at one point probably earned their positions, mind you. See, again, aristocracy means rule of the best. And generally speaking, aristocratic families are created by people who genuinely did do something amazing. Like creating their own kingdom, for example, or fiefdom, or more likely in a more established structure like the 41st millennium, by carrying out some great military deed, and thus being rewarded by a planetary governor, or some great feat of diplomacy, or some great feat of commerce, or one of the dozens of things that will affect entire planets, and thus be worthy of a hereditary reward. But... Over time, of course, the fruit will begin to fall further and further from the tree, as initially the offspring of the great man is relatively likely to be great men in and of themselves, if for no other reason than because they have access to the finest education available. Obviously then, the aristocracy will produce superior administrators and rulers and military men to the simple plebeians, who didn't have access to the same kind of schooling. Makes sense, right? But again, as we've seen with the Imperium, any long-standing and successful system will eventually be overrun by complacency, corruption, and indolence. And the same obviously holds true for the aristocracy as well. Now these systems, once they are properly entrenched, are very, very, very difficult to get rid of. At least through anything but more dramatic means. In our world, these entrenched systems were relatively frequently interfered with, disrupted, or outright destroyed by various external factors, or occasionally internal ones as well, though that was quite a bit rarer. A enemy invasion, for example, by an enemy that uses simply better tactics than you, is obviously going to encourage a rapid militarization and re-evaluation of one's own tactical expertise. Or 
an evolution in weaponry or in agricultural science. If another nation is simply producing way more food than you to the point where it begins to dominate the market, well, you're going to have to do something about that. Or occasionally, internal factors like the French or the Russian Revolution, where the peasantry rose up in a rather vehement objection to the excesses of their ruling class. But within the Imperium, this becomes a lot harder. Even if there was a populist uprising, the Imperium would probably just come by and go, no, and slap it down, and then return Imperial rule. Even if the uprising was successful, it would then either have the option to join the Imperium and pretend that nothing happened, and thus be subjected largely to the rules and regulations of the Imperium yet again, or they'd have to go separatist and get slapped the hell back down again. Not to mention the enormous difference in military power on most of these worlds. A military uprising with relative parity in weaponry might be possible, but if you're on an agricultural world, or a feudal world, where the rulers have las guns and a few thousand Imperial Guard level troops, or at the very least PDF with automatic weaponry, good luck rising up. And obviously any failed uprising would make it even worse. And the Imperium has gotten pretty damn good at crushing uprisings. In fact, they've structured their entire military on the assumption that units will rebel, and they can then be destroyed by the combined arms of other Imperial Guard units. See. Again, whilst the Imperium by and large will ignore the internal strife of a planet, unless there's some chaos afoot, of course, in which case it might get very involved very quickly, that only extends so far as the planet is able to maintain its commitments to the Imperium. So long as the Imperium receives its tithes, it doesn't care. But a large-scale war on a planet does tend to impact production just a little bit. And so any potential uprisers or revolutionaries had better get it all done and sorted quite quickly, lest the Imperium decide to interfere with their bid for freedom, and then institute significantly more repressive measures after the fact to make sure that productivity will not fall again. And, worse still of course, any freedom movement within the Imperium, any movement looking for liberté, égalité, etc. Well, um, let's just say that that does tend to be a fertile breeding ground for uh, chaos. <laughs> In fact, I'm not entirely convinced that our current year real world political problems aren't actually inspired by chaos. So you can see how any nearby Imperial Inquisitors might raise a very damning eyebrow at uh, local flashpoints, shall we say. And so, yet again, the aristocracy will eventually begin to devolve into the rule of the worst, rather than the best. And once this has been going on for 10,000 years across the Imperium, you can see the problems. You can see why the Imperium falling further and further backwards in technology is actually practically unavoidable rather than particularly unrealistic at all. And one final point is the teaching of technology. Let us return now to the Adeptus Mechanicus, and one of the interesting little things. See, 40k is in essence experiencing a competency crisis, both for the reasons that we've already discussed, like the Peter Plateau, and the fact that any incompetent organization will seek to hire yet more incompetence underneath it to prop itself up. There is also the problem of the collapse of the ability to maintain complex systems. The Imperium is full of hyper-complex systems and technologies, like warp engines, or plasma drives, or void shields, or plasma guns, etc. All of this shit is really gosh darn complex, and it takes a very long time for someone to be able to figure out how to maintain it, how to build it, and how to operate it.
This means that even if a tech priest has the best of intentions to raise up a worthy successor, it is going to take so damn long that it, there is every possibility that the master will not have been able to pass on all of the knowledge to the student. And that is in the best case scenario. If we're imagining a scenario where the master might be reluctant to teach his student all of his tricks, at least he himself be replaced. Because, hey, if you're the only guy on the planet that knows how to make void shields, well, you're going to be a very important person, aren't you? And if there are two of you, well, not quite as important anymore now, are you? <laughs> And this, in turn, then, of course, leads to the failure of the complex systems. Because, sooner or later, there just won't be enough people capable of operating them. And as the number of total people decreases, there will be more work and yet less time to train a replacement, and so on, and so on, and so on. The Imperium is in a permanent technological decline because of these reasons, and only an enormous shake-up of the entire Imperium will ever stand any chance of halting it, even less so reversing it. I hope that's some food for thought there. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.